Samuel is dead. Israel is lamenting uh, and has buried him in Ramah. And Saul has removed from the land those who were uh, uh, mediums. And he missed one. He got them all. Uh, I don't know how many he missed, but he missed this one. Uh, she went underground. Uh, and the Philistines have gathered. They've camped in uh, Shunan. And Saul gathered all Israel together in Gilboa. When you look on a map, you probably won't find, unless you have a really good map, you probably won't find Gilboa. But what you will find is Jezreel. And Jezreel, Bil, Gilboa was part of Jezreel. And Jezreel is a, is a bigger area. And this valley, there's a valley between these two areas of Jezreel. And this is really important on a map, which I'll, I'll draw on the board for you in a minute. Uh, when Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. But listen, that's Saul. That's the way he was in chapter 17. If you remember that story of David and Goliath, this is the same. I mean, you talk about the way somebody, I mean, this is old man Cosmos Diabolicus thinking. He's the same guy uh, in chapter 28. He was in 17 about fear. And uh, I mean, he, he, sees, he sees the camp. And listen, his imagination, listen, it doesn't matter. When you see your enemy, your eyes ought to be on God. That's to whom your refuge is. That's where your redeemer is. That's where your deliverer is. Listen, when you put your eyes on, your, on the war part and not on the victory part, uh, you could be in great trouble within your own life. Saul inquires of the Lord. Watch this in verse 6. He inquires of the Lord. The Lord does not answer him. Listen, he doesn't answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. There is no way to get to God. That's the point, isn't it? No way under the old covenant. This is old covenant. Saul said to his servant, seek me a woman who is a medium that I can go and inquire of her. And it's interesting to me that his advisor, when he says servant, he's talking about a bodyguard or an advisor, a close advisor to him. He knows that there's one that's active. That's interesting to me. Now, he's put a, he, he has swept through the whole nation and got rid of all of them. He didn't get her. And she must have been a good one because they hit her. And his advisor knows where she is. She, he knows there's a medium in in uh, indoor and she's called the witch of indoor in the in the english um, that's how we refer to her then in verse 8 saul disguises himself puts on different clothes and he goes with two men with him who were bodyguards and they came to the woman by night and they said conjure up for uh, for me please and bring up for me uh, someone who i will give you the name of the woman said to him behold you know what Saul has done, how he's cut off all the demons and uh, the mediums and spiritualists from the land. Why are you laying a snare, a trap for my life and bring about my death? Saul vowed. Now, she don't know it, Saul. Saul vowed to her by the Lord saying, as the Lord lives. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> as the Lord lives, there shall be no punishment come upon you for this thing. The woman said, whom shall I bring up? And so she was confident about that. She still doesn't know he's the king. Uh, who do you want? He says, I want, bring up Samuel for me. The woman, when the woman saw Samuel, she screamed with bloody murder. That's it. She screamed out with a loud voice. We would say in our vernacular, bloody murder. At least I would. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. It, in other words, it didn't click the first time. Call up Sam. You know, and, and, and then all of a sudden, she calls him up, and it clicks. Oh, wait a minute. Samuel, the prophet, and Saul. It clicks. He said to her, 
uh, uh, let's see, uh, the king said to her, don't be afraid, verse 13, for what you, what do you, but what do you see? Give me details. Now he's interested in details. He's in trouble with the Lord because he wouldn't do details of the will of God. You remember that? Now he wants details. Mm. Uh, what do you see? Give me details. The woman said to Saul, I see a divine being, a spirit, coming up out of the earth. He said to her, what is his form? She said, an old man is coming up. This is her vision. And he is wrapped with a robe. Saul knew that that was Samuel. He, he bowed to the ground and did homage or worship. Samuel, <laughs> now listen, she don't have this power. A demon don't have the power to call anybody back from the dead. This is divine, this is divine intervention. Right? This is why when she saw it, she, she screamed like bloody murder. Oh my goodness, it really is, it's really here. What is this? I mean, I've been doing this all my life. I've never got this. Samuel said to Saul, Samuel speaks to Saul. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am greatly distressed. Yeah. For the Philistines were raging war against me. God has departed from me and answer me and will answer me no more. Either, and then he goes through, either with prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may, that you may make known to me what I should do. Samuel said, why then do you ask me since the Lord has departed from you and has become your adversary, your enemy? The Lord has done according to as he spoke through me. And so he gives him the categorical doctrine that he taught him before he left earth. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand, has given to your neighbor, David. As for you, as you did not obey, and he goes and tells him why again. You did not obey the Lord did, and did not execute his fierce rap on Amalek. So the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, now he gives him a future prophecy. Moreover, the Lord will also give over Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines. Therefore, tomorrow... This is interesting to me. This prophet back up on earth, get, get, I mean, he's still down there, but the prophecy is back and is prevalent to what is going to happen to him. I mean, this is a prophet. This is a prophecy for the future. He, he gave a, he said, listen, I taught you a prophecy about your past. I'm, okay, now I'm going to give you a future prophecy. Listen to what he says. Therefore, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. I mean, he means tomorrow. I mean, today's Thursday, tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow, therefore tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Man, be careful what you ask for. Indeed, the Lord will give Give over the army of Israel to the hands of the Philistines. And you and your sons are going to be with me tomorrow. Jesus, you remember, Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He says to him, tomorrow you will be with me in paradise. You'll be with me tomorrow. And Saul falls full length to the ground and passes out and throws up. And I don't know what all. Okay, there's where I got my title, A Sermon from Hell. Now, literally, as you and I know, that we're talking about Sheol. Sheol has three parts, and, and, but I thought if I had a marquee, that's what I'd put out on my marquee and see if I could get anybody to come to church tonight to hear a sermon from hell. But I don't have one, so I just have one in my mind. Let's have a word of prayer, and I want to get into my study tonight about this. I'll give you a moment of silence as a believer priest 
classroom etiquette, confession of sin. Why? Because you have to be spiritual. Can't be carnal and study the Bible. Can't, you can't learn it, carnality, and you can't apply it. You can't live it. So, you know, here is a, a procedure that you have to use in both categories. Learning the Bible, you have to be spiritual. The way you identify spirituality is be sure there's no unconfessed sin in your life. And if there is, then you confess them and you're a spiritual learning the word of God. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I give you a moment. It should be mental attitude sins. You could examine them. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue of earth sins. And I require the same thing for those who are involved in classroom etiquette on the Internet as much as uh, we do in our home setting of classroom. It is classroom wherever you sit. Confess your sin before God. Allow the Holy Spirit to teach you truth. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way both by automobile and by Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth sets you free. Free from the cosmic system of lies that cause our life to be a stumbling block not only to ourselves but to others like Jesus talked to Peter about in Matthew 16. So we pray tonight, Father, the Holy Spirit would touch our life with the truth and it, our life would never be the same because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, <clears throat> we're looking at this. Uh, Saul can't get a prayer to heaven, and so he sends one to hell. Most people are intrigued about this story. If this story was right on the 6 o'clock news, their version would be about the drama of the witch, wouldn't it? But you see, the real, the real true story behind this is not the witch, it's the word. The word of God. And while you may be intrigued about the witch, this is not where the true story is. The true story is in the word of God. And listen, Samuel, you would, look, are there, look, are there second chances for people? There are second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, 26,000 million. As long as you're on this side, as long as you're on, the, on this side of the earth, on the living side of the earth, if you're on the dying side of it, there is none. Saul has, listen, of the message from hell to Saul, from Samuel, from Sheol, was... Get right with God. You're going to die tomorrow and be here with me. At least have one day. Right? Listen, you're going to go to war. You're going to die as a soldier, not as a king. Go out with great honor. And listen, w will God honor that? Do we, have, do we have history of that? Huh? Samson. Absolutely. Samson is a great example of this. Samson is a great example of this. A great example. But you see, what we're looking for is spiritual substance, not flash in the pan. I don't care about this witch. I care about the word that was brought to him. Not the witch that was brought to him, but the word. Okay? This is how the devil, by bringing us, look, we all got to deal with the witch of Endor. That's a person, I mean, she brings them up and she gets a lesson. I hope she took it. I mean, she absolutely knew that she didn't bring them up. She knew the Lord brought them up. She never did that before. I mean, demons, listen, they'd have been afraid of her. Listen, here, come, look, what we want you to do is we, we want to go to hell. And they well, no, that's the one place I don't want to go, right? Every time, Je they, every time Jesus showed up in their presence, they began to beg, don't send me, don't send me, don't send me. <laughs> well, anyhow. 
When I looked at this, I, d I broke my passage, verses 1 through 19. I broke it down into four, uh, four uh, sections of homiletical points. In verses 1 through 5, we're at war with the Philistines. That's, that's what he was concerned about, that he, he, couldn't get a, he couldn't get an answer from heaven, so he thought maybe he could get one from hell. In verses 6 and 7, he was, he was a believer without a prayer. Now, we hear that phrase a lot. When I, I wrote that down, I said, boy, I hear that a lot. You know, you don't have a prayer. You know, you ever heard that? And I, I grew up with people saying, you don't have a prayer. Well, I never thought I had one to start with, but I knew what it meant. <laughs> Man, I never. When I got old enough that the little prayer I had when I was a little bit kid now I lay me down to sleep or pray to the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, whatever, the Lord will take my soul to keep or something. I know I was done with that prayer by the time I started school. And I ever prayed that prayer again. I can hardly remember it, but I can remember it. Shows the influence on a child, doesn't it? What a wonderful thing it is to be able to have prayer with him as my father, a conversation with him, not have to have some kind of rote prayer. Right? You know, they used, to, they used to sing this lullaby about kids, rock a -bye baby in the treetop. Who, how, how does that? I mean, I mean you, have to, you have to sing that to a little baby because the time they're three, they don't want that. Uh, the cradle will drop or whatever that thing was. My goodness, who sings that song? That was one of those songs I used to sing when I was a little kid, too, and I got old enough when I said, have you ever paid any attention to those words? Who puts their baby in the treetop and when the wind blows or whatever it went? I mean, what are the odds? I would. Well, anyhow, in verses 8 through 14, we meet a witch who survived the purging by, by King Saul, which is kind of interesting, the whole story, isn't it? And then verses, unless you know why she survived now, don't you? In the plan of God, right? This is why she, she survived. And listen, if she's smart, she got saved. If she got smart, she'd go like, look, how did this king get there? Maybe I can get there too. He's going to Sheol. I would like to go there and find out how this all worked. I've never had this before. I mean, before I've had to come up with stories. This one, I got a story to tell. Point number one. Point number one. The background to our lesson is a war with the Philistines that terrifies King Saul because of what losing would mean to his family in Israel. We see that in the first part of the story. Notice how this story is introduced, as I mentioned to you, now it came about in those days. Saul is in reversion. He's trying to kill David, God's choice of a king. As a result, David goes over and joins the, the Philistine army. And I'm going like, is everybody nuts today in the plan of God? Is everybody lost any kind of common sense of spiritually? What are you doing, David? This is the same Philistine army that you hit, took their top man out and cut his head off. Which is interesting in itself. Listen, and for me, the lesson for me in this is two wrongs don't make a right. Well, he's out to kill me. I'm going to join the enemy's army. For what reason would you do that, David? It's just a good strategic military move. Are you kidding me? Two wrongs don't make a right. Listen, and here's the point. You don't fight evil with evil. We talked about it last night out of 1 Peter 3, 9 and 10. You don't fight evil with evil and think you can win. Evil wins. Right? Evil fighting evil. I mean, evil plus ego. 
e evil equals eagle, e evil, equal. I mean, how, if you like a cup of coffee, I'll take a little equal. You don't fight evil with evil. And so, listen, here's the wonderful thing, people. This is what I love. We got two nutty people. One is the king and one is the coming king, and they're both not eating a fruitcake right now. So you know what God has to do? He does wonderfully what he does. He takes charge. He intervenes. So we have the directive will of God. We have the permissive will of God. And we have the overruling will of God. And thank God for that. Because these, both these guys are out in the Thule's. Wherever that is. I know we have them in Michigan, but I don't know if you have Thule's down here in the south or not. Do you? Okay. Thule's. So God intervenes because of the overruling will, because bad decisions are being made. God intervenes. I love that about God. You're not going to screw up the plan of God. You want to screw up your life? You go ahead. That's volitional. But sovereignty will not let your bad decisions mess up the plan of God. I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that for myself. Right? Right? Because there's times we get fruit, fruit, nut here in a fruitcake, in it? Sometimes we get there. Not often, but enough that we're reminded of a story like this. Now, David goes to fight against Israel. Listen, if, if he'd have stayed. Now, listen, the commanding general, the head guy, the five-star guy, says, David and them can't go. That's stupid. I'm going to take 600 of the most fierce fighting Israelites with me to fight the Israelites and then get attacked from behind? I don't think so. That's a smart general. That's a really smart guy. But listen, that's part of God's intervention for David because if David went out there, he'd have killed a bunch of Israelites. Listen, what kind of a king, listen, all those mourning families and the next day you've killed all of them, you're going to be their king? I don't think so. So God, God protects his plan because everybody's nutter in a fruitcake. And listen, the enemy is smarter than the two people that are, that are king, going to be kings in Israel. The commanding general is smarter than both these guys because it just doesn't make good military sense to take 600 of the most fierce fighting people we've seen in a long time and put them on our team and put them in the back. They were going to put them in the back, and they went like, that ain't going to happen. And that's part of God's divine intervention. And he has to use an unbelieving commanding general that has good military sense, which he did, because he's got two people that have been designed to be king that are, that are nutty. And I'm being kind, ain't I? Uh, wanna look at, I want to compare two things. If you got your Bible, stay there. Look at 28, 19. More the Lord will also give over Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistine. Therefore, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. They'll die. Indeed, the Lord will give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistine. See, that would have happened if David had been there or not. We've been looking for, when this, when this day's over, we're looking for a new king. But, which is not hard for God. Right? I mean, he could raise a king out of a, a stone if he had that. I mean, it's no big deal for God. Now, look, look at 29.5. The commanding general, the, if you read chapter 29, we didn't, but if you would, then you would find that the commanding general, uh, the five-star got with his top com field commanders and said, look, and, and, and this is what they said. They said, is this not David of whom they sing and dance? Saying, Saul slayed his thousands, David his ten thousand. You know what that was against? It was against the Philistines' army, who was as strong as they are today, and had some top guys, and David took them down, and the people ran like scald dogs. They remember this. That's good military. These guys are good military. There's a no way. This David, I don't think so. And this is how God is working this whole thing. They see, who's behind the scene working this? 
God. You know why? Because everybody's got on the scene is dumber, dumber than a fruitcake. No, I don't. Nuttier. Nuttier than a fruitcake. I don't about dumb. Look, when you look at this passage of Scripture in chapter 28, you got three main characters. You got Samuel, you got Saul, and you got the witch of Endor. Now, you got two armies. They're drawn in line. We're going to show you something. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Here's the Jordan down to the Dead Sea. Are you with me? Right here is, a, is the territory of Ishkar. I-S-S-C-A-C-H-A-R. Ishkar. That's the territory. You know that? The 12 tribes of Israel assigned territory. That's their territory right there. Are you with me? This is where the war is going to take place. Right here is Shunan. This, this is where the Philistines are. And right down here is Gilboa or Jezreel. You, you with me? Yeah. That's where that is. And there's a valley. The Jezreel Valley goes through there. And that's where they're lined up. Here's that valley. And they're lined up here in battle array, ready for war. Indoor is right up here. Indoor. Now watch this. Saul is here. Philistines are here. Right there is where they are. There's about three miles. They're three miles away with a valley in between them where the war is going to take place. They're about three miles away. Here to there is about eight miles. It's a crow. Eight miles. You know what Saul did? Two bodyguards. He went behind enemy lines to talk to this witch. He went behind, he went deep. He went, what, five miles behind the enemy line to meet with the witch of Endor. You know why? In his mind, because he, God wouldn't answer his prayers. Well, what good is this witch going to be for you? And look, takes, takes two top guards with him, right? I mean, these guys must have been something. These are sacrificial lambs if they get caught, aren't they? Takes two bodyguards with him, two top guys, two top military guys, puts them in, they all in disguise, and they, they get through enemy line. They get through enemy line, and they went deep behind enemy line. And they're going to have to come back. They're going to come back. They're going to go out there, and they're going to come back, and they're going to fight this war knowing how this thing's going to turn out. They're going to fight this war. Many people are going to die, and they know how it's going to turn out. Could have saved that whole trip, couldn't we? It's kind of just kind of interesting when you see it, isn't it? Yeah. When you get a look, when you put your eyes on it, then there's a whole other story behind the story, uh, in, in my opinion. And when you read chapter 31, when this, when this whole war takes place and it gets over, and Saul, Saul commits suicide, right? Commits suicide. What a coward. What a coward. What a coward. I mean, you prop up against uh, you prop up against that, and you fight the enemy until you can't fight anymore. Did he know he was going to die that day any day? So he says, yeah, "Kill me." His bodyguard kills him. What a coward! Well, that's the way he lived. Let's see. Chat. Watch what they do. They run. They 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 swamp over Israel. Uh, they they come when they get on the scene. Uh, Saul is dead. They ki they kill both of his sons, Jonathan. But that was a great loss to David. Killed Jonathan. Killed another brother. And then got when they got here, he was already dead. 
right? His bodyguard to his bodyguard. His bodyguard, when he killed him, had to kill himself. Two out. And you know what they did? Let me tell you what they did. Let me tell you what they did. Chapter 31, verse 9. Watch what they did. This shows you, this shows you, listen, this shows you, this shows you how bad in their gut this whole thing when David beat uh, Goliath. Listen, look at verse 9. They cut off his head, stripped off his weapons, sent them through the land, and then wound up, which is another story in itself, in the temple of Beth Shan, which is a whole other story and a wonderful story. Maybe I'll be able to get to it. And how a, a small band of guys go out and get it and bring it back. But listen, they cut off his head. You know why? Hmm? David did it to their big guy. And David did this to their guy to show Israel God is greater. And they take it and show it around and, and wind up putting it in their temple. Um, and you remember David took, listen, David took his head to the king and took his sword, kept the sword to himself and then gave it to, gave it to the priest and they put it uh, they put it uh, with, the, with the temple, right? And then when he was on the run, he went and took the sword. You remember that? Oh, uh, yeah, well, just. The reconnaissance of the Philistines were pretty strong, weren't they? They were pretty good. And they did it. They, went, they turned around. They, they did the whole thing to Israel, what Israel had done to them. I just, I just find that to be interesting. Um. In the Bible, isn't the Bible just an interesting book? I mean, you get into stuff like this, and it just goes in. You go like, oh, this is so good, Father. This is so good. Point number two. It, 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 sometimes the story gets so good, you, you forget why you're studying it. You know, what, what's the doctrinal point to all this, Ron? And I go, like, I don't know. just blood and guts. It's just, I mean, it's just blood and guts all over the place. It just, it's so good. Uh, this, point number two, Saul is actually living out the saying without a prayer. This shows how desperate he was, doesn't he? Listen, this is a desperate move to go behind eight, to go eight miles, to go deep. Un, uh, this is, this guy's desperate. And listen, he got good news, but he didn't use it as good news. He got good news. Get your life right with God and die like a die, die like die like a man. A spiritual man. Die like a spiritual man. Don't die like a coward. Die like a man. Die with your boots on, with a sword in your hand, and and you want me, come and get me. I don't know. That takes a God. That takes a God in the in the man, doesn't it? Just but did he, have a, did he have an example in the Bible of a guy like that? Yeah, a guy just like himself that said, listen, I want to die with God, not without him. I was, I was a fool to live without God. I'm not going to die without him. So, Father, I don't deserve this last request, but I need it. I want to, I, I, I want to die with my boots on like a man of God. And he honored it, didn't he? Love that story. Samson's a jerk through the whole Bible until he gets to the end and he becomes his great hero. God just honors that stuff. Just honors it. I mean, if you'll honor him, he'll honor you with it. I love that. Well, anyhow. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord didn't answer him. And the Bible says either by dreams or Urim. Urim. It, it, Urim. I better say that plainer. People go like, what did he just say? Some guy in China tonight is going like, what did he say? <laughs> it's, it's spelled U-R-I-M. And it was, it was on the breastplate of the high priest. And it was one of those things that, that, that had the, the identity of the 12 tribes and how they lined up for God and all that. We've talked about that. And, and because of that, you have the power of prayer. You have the priesthood the high priesthood prayer. And, and the New Testament picks that subject in Hebrews and tells us we have that same three, same idea, doesn't it? 
uh, of shadow Christology. I put that on your paper because I think that's kind of important uh, in Hebrews 5 through 8 and 10. The God, and so I, I, I said, I better start getting to my subject matter uh, and get out of the war game. The gospel of Christ is the first step to a prayer life, isn't it? The first step. It's not the only step, but it's the first step. In Isaiah 53, 5 and, and on, I love this. It says, when he, Christ, was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. See, all of that, every bit of that crucifixion, every bit of that crucifixion was for us. Isn't that interesting? And how he lays that out into four points is just magnificent. It, that, that is soteriology. That whole passage is about soteriology. And Paul picks this up and, and goes into great theology, soteriology, uh, on this subject matter of salvation. It, it is a pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquity. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourgings we are healed. That is a powerful idea. As a believer, Saul's problem is just the opposite of Psalms 103.10. Psalms 103.10, then this should have been his Psalms, but it wasn't. <clears throat> he, God, has not dealt with us according to our sin, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Wouldn't have been nice. But you see, <clears throat> he, but because he doesn't acknowledge it, he is now, God is now going to deal with him according to his sin and according to his iniquity. Do you understand that? It's called divine judgment, divine discipline, divine judgment. You don't have to because that's already been judged, man. That's already been judged by Christ. All of that's been judged by Christ. Old Testament, New Testament. When Paul says that Christ uh, died for our sins according to the Scriptures, he's referring to Isaiah 53 was buried and raised from the dead. He's talking, he's talking about Psalms 22. It's also, he's, the scripture he's referring to is the Old Testament. <laughs> you see, the confession of sin is, Paul's an, is Saul's answer. You don't have to go down like this. You can go down as a real hero. You're going to go down. Tomorrow you're going to die. It's your day. But listen, it's how you die. Man, he could have done this. All he had, listen, all you have to do in reverse them is confess your sin and get back with the program. Samuel did, I mean, uh, Samson did it. We all do it if we're smart. David understood this when he, when he, when David understood this was the answer to his reversionism in Psalms 51 when he said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquities, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me and against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. He did it. I mean, that's why we do it. I mean, you can get your second chance, third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance is because Christ gave it, gave you the privilege. You can confess your sin because your sin's been dealt with. Now it's about your living, not about your dying. It's about your living. As a result of no prayer life, Saul becomes desperate for a prophetic word about the out outcome of the war, so he seeks out a medium or a soothsayer. Remember that he had previously purged all of the divination from the priest nation of Israel. Yet Saul's advisors knew about the witch of Endor that's eight miles behind enemy lines. And he goes see her. Hey, I don't know. I mean, we're all puzzled when people do stuff that's so out there. They get into sin. They get into reversionism. They don't want to listen. And they just get so far into their mess. Right? You wonder. 
And sometimes they can't back their car out of it. They just don't want to. They could, but they don't want to. They're going to die in that mess. And tomorrow, they're going to be with the Lord. They're going to die the way they live. Well, it's kind of interesting. She's still in business underground. The, the witch of Endor is interesting because she survived Saul's early purging of divination from the priest nation. Leviticus 19.31, that's, he, did, he did do that. Saul was unable to send a prayer to heaven, so he sent one to hell. He disguised himself, goes eight miles behind the enemy line, and she refuses to practice it, and he has to convince her to do it. She doesn't want to do it because she's afraid we're to get back and she'd be killed, right? That's what she said. She was convinced to continue, and not knowing it was the king, she went on. When she saw Samuel's spirit, she realized that the guy talking to her was King Saul, the client. He reassures her and asks her uh, to give him details of what she's seeing. Now understand that demons don't have this power. Please understand that. They don't have this kind of power. Anybody on earth. Because they understand the reality of it. They understand how real it is. Samuel's sermon from hell was in two parts. Verses 15 through 18, referring to past ca categorical doctrine taught to Saul that's still in, in force. And then the future in verse 19, you're going to die, your sons are going to die, and Israel's going to be defeated. The word of the God the word of God is taught in this sermon by a, ten, a dead prophet in Sheol to a living reversionistic king. Is God not wonderful? And yet he's not going to pay any attention to this message. He went all that way to get a message and uh, faints and, and she revives him, gives him food and everything and says, you got another trip back. What a sad, sad ending to a story. And so I laid that out for you that you might see. You'll see that the first part of the sermon has uh, one, two, three, four parts to it. Be well worth your time to re re revisit it. And the second part, the future part, uh, has three parts. Has three parts to it. Well worth your time to look at that. Um, because God has a word for Saul while he's living and it's a good word. Get your house in order. It's a good word. God is rejecting him as a king, as he's previously said, but he's not rejecting him as a son because tomorrow you will die and you will be with me, Samuel says. So, you understand that? He may reject you from service, but not from sonship. That's a locked deal. That deal is sealed. It was sealed in the Old Testament. It is sealed in the New. And God disciplines you. God disciplines you like he is with him. He's going to discipline him according to Hebrews 12 because he is a son. When David was in a similar situation... He confessed his sin. Saul has a second chance, but it's now. It's not tomorrow. I say that to you. You're listening to me by the internet. This is another chance for you to respond to the gospel of Christ. He died for your sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. And when you believe it, you're saved. Not by works. But by grace, you're saved by God's grace. Not that you deserve it. Christ brought the worth to your salvation. He did the work so you could receive the blessing by your faith. You know, 
the sad part of this story is this believer, Saul is a believer, at the end of this story, he loses both wars. He loses the, the physical war, the national war, and he loses his, the spiritual war. He loses both of them. How sick is that? How bad is that, people? Well, listen, I ought to be winning both of them. They lose both of them. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your love and mercy and grace. We thank you, Father, for this story. It's all about the word, not the witch. And it's about the fact that Saul was given his final opportunity. Almost, almost it reminded me of the story of Judas at the Last Supper when Jesus offers him another opportunity. You don't have to do this. You do not have to do this. And he wouldn't listen. The son of perdition. He becomes known as the son of perdition because he wouldn't listen. I pray tonight, Father, that we would pay attention to this. The importance of this story is the word of God. It's about being obedient to the word of God. And true to his reversionistic form, Saul is not going to listen to the final words given to him. He's not going to listen. How sad is that? How sad is that? Yet it's our responsibility to tell them the truth. May we be great ambassadors for Christ. Great priests, we tell people the truth because the truth is what sets them free. Lies don't set nobody free. Sets nobody free. Puts them in bondage. But the truth of the word of God, when believed upon, sets us free. May we be free indeed. In Jesus' name, amen.